Great. Well, hello, everyone. Um, it's my big, big pleasure to have uh, with us today, Catherine McKenna. Uh, Catherine has had um, a, a number of very important positions over the years. Uh, first um, was former uh, Minister of Environment and Climate in, in Canada and later uh, Minister of Industry. Uh, two very important perspectives on, on our discussion and the overall uh, Global Roundtable this week. Um, and then today uh, is chair of the high level expert group on the net zero emissions commitments of non state entities. So that includes the private sector, uh, uh, sub national governments like municipalities. And um, she's chairing a very, this very important group who will be issuing their report uh, shortly before COP. And I'm looking forward to, to getting some early peek, if we can, in terms of the types of recommendations that the group is, is going to be putting forward. Um, but Catherine, if, if okay with you, uh, I would like to start a little bit on your, your experience um, in the political realm. Um, real pleasure to have you with us and to be talking about, um, you know, some of the challenges. Now, now Canada today, you know, you have strong electoral support for climate action, but of course there, there is a very large fossil fuel exposure. Um, it's a resource-based economy, largely. So, um, you know, as former Minister of Environment and Climate and um, Infrastructure, um, you know, how do you see companies and entire industries navigating their way forward towards full decarbonization? What sort of trade-offs do you think need to be made along the way? Uh, well, thanks, Eric, uh, and it's really great to be joining you. Um, look, I mean, what I've learned from the Canadian experience, I mean, there's a, there's a number of things. Uh, so we'll take one of the initiatives that was really important in Canada. Uh, I was tasked by the Prime Minister to get a climate plan, um, but in particular, one of the biggest challenging pieces was going to be get a price on carbon pollution. Uh, I knew that was going to be a huge challenge. Um, there are many other elements of our plan, full phase out, clean fuel standard, massive investments in infrastructure, um, but this was you know, going to be one that was going to be hard. Uh, there are a lot of lessons from it, but one of the one of the biggest lessons was the importance of working uh, with the business sector. Um, so I had the support of environmentalists, but but I realized I actually we, we I went to an event. Uh, World Bank had the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition, and there was not one Canadian business there. Um, and I thought, well, heck, other countries have businesses there. I got to go round up some troops. And so I went. Um, and look, when you first start talking about it. Uh, you know, a lot of businesses were large businesses were skeptical, but I was able to convince um, folks, uh, a couple of banks came on board and then all banks came on board. That's, uh, you know, there is momentum, uh, you know, if you have your competitors there. Um, I managed to get manufacturing companies, um, telecom companies, uh, even an oil and gas company. And that was really important. And I, I think it's often understated, like when, when government's trying to do hard things, it really helps to have the high ambition coalition uh, of business leaders. Now, of course, business leaders want practical, smart policies, and, and I won't go into the weeds, but we have not only a direct price, so a price of the pump, we also have an output-based pricing system. So that recognizes that different industries have, you know, different abilities to decarbonize, uh, you know, at different rates right now. Um, so it was, uh, I, I really learned that business was hugely important. So that's like the good side. The bad side is sometimes on policies. And you know what? Of course, in government, you do consultations, you get feedback. That's fine. But some folks who are like, you know, we're a climate leader, um, you know, I would think that they were, you know, engaging in good faith and they support our policy, but then they go knock on, uh, you know, the finance minister's door and say, do not do that. That's terrible. And so the problem with that, if you actually want to decarbonize, um, you, you need to support policies that are going to help do that. Of course, you know, they have to be tailored. And um, but I think that, uh, you know, lobbying against climate uh, can be a massive challenge for government. Um, so we want to see the high ambition loop. That's what I saw in carbon pricing. Um, but the flip side was, you know, when you have folks that, you know, are, are really going hard against your policies as opposed to trying to improve them and recognize like, look, we're all in this together. I'll give you another example, though, uh, in my other role. So I was Minister of Infrastructure, uh, and we created the, uh, the Canada Infrastructure Bank. I came in, and I was quite tasked to kind of get it going. So it had been in operation for four years, and hadn't, maybe three years by the time I took over, um, and it just was not working. 
Um, it was not actually getting money out the door. Um, and in fact, I think something that we often hear in the blended finance conversation globally is it wasn't figuring out risk. It was actually competing against the private sector, which is obviously not the point. The point of the, it was to get sustainable infrastructure built. Um, and the quantum of money required, um, we also started a national infrastructure, we, we were doing a national infrastructure plan. I mean, when you actually look long-term, the amount of money required, obviously you need to engage the private sector. It's massive and it's way larger than, than government can, can invest in, but also the private sector is there. There is money, but you need to find opportunities and you need to obviously de-risk. So that was a big focus. And the good news now um, is that the infrastructure bank is actually funding a whole range of projects. Just like one is just now we're going to have uh, we're going to have electric buses in every municipality across Canada because they've been able to figure out financing. But there's also major, uh, major renewable projects. So I think that there's a really important uh, relationship between the private sector and government. And at its best, it actually enables you to go faster, drive down emissions um, while growing your economy and create jobs, which is obviously critically important as well. Great, thanks, Catherine. And I can unpack that on, uh, with um, many more questions. So let, let me start that. Um, you, you talk about the role of the private sector industry in, in starting to do things voluntarily. Do, do you think voluntary action negates the need for regulation or what's the relationship between the two? Uh, look, I think it, that voluntary action in a way leads often to regulation and in a positive sense. So I know sometimes like, you know, I hear from the private sector, I actually worked in the private sector as a corporate lawyer, um, you know, people don't like regulation, but, you know, regulation is going to come in these areas and it's needed, whether it's a voluntary carbon markets or making sure there's a level playing field. So everyone, you know, all major uh, corporations, financial institutions have a net zero plan uh, that they have, you know. Uh, well, they have a target, they have a plan, and that they are disclosing. But if you look at the um, CCFD, uh, Task Force on uh, Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, that actually went from something that was, you know, voluntary, uh, Canadian, great Canadian Mark Carney working, uh, leading on that, um, to something that is becoming mandatory in many jurisdictions and many uh, places. So I think that, that uh, you know, it demonstrates the importance, but there is a limit to voluntary initiatives on both sides. There's a limit if you're someone looking in, and there has been a lot of talk about greenwashing. Um, part of the reason that the, the Secretary General established the Net Zero Task Force, it's really the world's worst name. <laughs> Even the shortened name is, is terrible, HLEG. But we're really looking at standards and criteria for net zero commitments from financial institutions, um, corp corporates, and uh, cities and regions. But I mean, he was worried about greenwashing. And that, um, and so, one of the things that you, you see folks wanting, and it's not just civil society and people, but it is those, it's also shareholders, it's also employees, it's also investors. They actually wanna know, are these commitments real? Um, so, you know, that is important, but there's a limit because, you know, there are a lot of people who don't have net zero pledges, right? So that's the flip side that why you would want to regulate. One is provide clarity, transparency, be very, you know, you know, say exactly what is needed, um, including very early action that we need to see. But the flip side is you can then capture everyone. There are a lot of, as we all know, there are a lot of, you know, um, companies that aren't publicly listed that aren't doing this. They're state-owned enterprises. So I think that everyone, you know, needs to be striving for net zero. That is the only way we will meet global net zero. Um, but more importantly, building the cleaner future that we want with economic opportunity and jobs. And as I tell people, like, this isn't the biggest economic opportunity in our generation. It's the biggest economic opportunity ever. The quantum of investment um, in clean solutions and in clean infrastructure is absolutely massive. Um, and I think that's what we have to focus on, that we can move, we can transform, um, but we need to make sure we do it with discipline, with rigor, um, with ambition, um, and we need to start doing it now, like in a much faster, uh, faster way. Okay, excellent, Catherine. I would love to get some of your um, highlights of the types of recommendations that you see coming out of the report. But before we dive into that, I would like to follow um, on two of the points you raised. And when we think of the ambition 
there's the high end, sort of the, the leaders of what they're really pushing for, and there's the low end, what happens with parts of the industry that are very low ambition, um, dragging their feet or, or moving in the opposite direction. So in terms of the high end, you mentioned that as um, infrastructure minister, you, you were tasked with preparing a clean infrastructure plan. What is, um, as, as a policymaker, when you're preparing a plan of what, what is the, the art of the possible or what is the par art of what's needed um, uh, within a, in our national context in terms of a build out of a whole or a, a turnover of a whole new infrastructure. Um, what the private sector is doing, how much do the signals from the private sector feed into that plan? Do they help raise ambition? Uh, well, that's the hope. Um, I mean, you have to be clear about what your goals are. Uh, one of the main goals was being Canada being net zero by 2050. Um, so, I mean, that, it has to be consistent with that goal. Uh, so that was critically important and, and also consistent with the climate plan. There is a climate plan for Canada. I should say the national infrastructure uh, you know, assessment is underway, but when I started it, I mean, we did consultations to hear from folks. Um, and not surprisingly, actually, I mean, or maybe surprisingly for some people, um, there was a lot of ambition to get things done um, across the board. And there's, you know, the infrastructure needs in Canada uh, are huge. Um, and I'm sure that's the same in every single country. It's really figuring out, okay, where do you put, you know, limited taxpayer dollars? And then how do you leverage private sector dollars? Um, and uh, we got a lot of really good feedback, but you know the ambition uh, greatly exceeded the the, the funding from uh, from government. And I think that's important that people understand, right? Life is about choices, but if you can expand the pie and actually think about, okay, how do we get this money working? And I mean, you can look at, and I think we're doing great things in Canada and there's some really good programs that are really focused on deep decarbonization with heavy emitters, um, where it's a partnership with the private sector to leverage that. Um, the infrastructure bank is obviously an opportunity too. Another example is the Inflation Reduction Act in the US. So I was, you know, at, a, at the Columbia University's annual energy summit talking. I mean, it's kind of funny. I'm a Canadian like you, Eric. Um, so there I am talking with others like Mary Nichols, who obviously is well versed with what's going on in the US being American, but also um, as a, the former head of CARB and, and someone who's really engaged. Um, you know, you, you talk about the quantum of money that's being invested there, but it's dwarfed by the money that it will it will be able to attract. And I think that's the that you know that's the exciting piece. Having said that, I was a little bit of Debbie Downer because I did say, well, you will need to regulate some things too, like you know, methane is a good example, and there are other things you need to do and get a price on pollution. And I think everyone kind of laughed. And I was like, give the money back. If you give the money back to people and they're better off <laughs> and you do it in a smart way with industry, um, it's possible. Although, you know, different political contexts. Absolutely. And obviously there's very high expectations there, but there's a lot of proving out that needs to be done. Um, obviously, probably sector by sector and what the tools yeah. are, how to essentially uh, blend capital or incentives. And in the end of the day, it's, it's having a stable and enabling environment. Private sector is looking for certainty, understanding, you know, where, where the government priorities are going to be so that they can, you know, uh, judge or steer their, their investments uh, accordingly. Now, um, the other end of the um, ambition is sort of the, the dragging feet level. And I'm just wondering, uh, because obviously not everybody's on board with this, the net zero transition or, or other aspects. Um, obviously, a price on carbon applies to all, well, um, uh, you know, it, it, it will vary by industry, by sector, depending on the, on the instrument used. But in general, I think from an investor or a bank view, a price on carbon is a very useful tool. Um, but it's not in place everywhere. And, and when we talk about voluntary action, for instance, within the net zero alliances, obviously one of the concerns is, you know, those who are moving in the opposite direction. And we even hear talk about a, you know, a dirty premium. You can, you can have financial instruments that actually benefit from the fact that some are dropping these high carbon assets so they can be picked up on the cheap. How, how do you believe policymakers get influenced by these, um, those at the, at the, you know, dragging their feet? Does it, is there a focus sufficiently on what impact they have on the overall picture? Well, I mean, this is the this is the the thing about net zero. There's a lot of skepticism in some quarters about net zero, 
uh, commitments. And, and look, there's really two choices with net zero or there's two outcomes with net zero. Net zero encourages ambitious action because it provides discipline. You've got a target, you'll do interim targets. You're gonna actually take the steps you need. You're gonna do it in a transparent way, driving down emissions, increasing investments in clean at scale, doing the things you need to do, investing in innovation. That's the good thing. If everyone does that, it's great. The problem is if it's used as, you know, for to delay any action, um, you know, to say 2049 or a time, you know, CEOs are only in place for a short period of time. They're not there in 2050. So that is like, that could be a very, obviously a terrible outcome. And so that is the challenge, um, you know, with, with folks that sign up and they actually don't want to do anything. Um, that's a that's a massive problem. I mean, one, it's a massive problem because guess what? Everyone gets tainted then because they will get called out and people will say things like, you're not doing any reductions emission, you're buying cheap credits and you, know, you continue to invest hugely in fossil fuels or something, right? That could be an example. We've seen all the, we've seen examples like that. Uh, and it brings down the leaders. And I've met a lot of leaders that are working extremely hard, not only doing the hard work themselves, doing the work through their value chain. And that's transformational. Like if you're actually working with the SMEs, uh, you know, you, you know, people in your value chain, you can help support them. Now, you know, most people actually want to do good. They may not know how, or, you know, they need incentives to do that. And so I've really seen that the, you know, the transformational ability to do that, to get people to uh, step up, you know, you see examples where companies say, I'm going to be net zero. They may even say 2040, they may be earlier, and then they find new suppliers or their suppliers find new innovations. So that is what we need. Um, but the thing is, you know, if everyone becomes cynical and by everyone, I mean the public, because the public really matters in this space, but also investors, also young employees, um, like they really now are pretty hardcore. Um, we're going to run into massive problems. Um, and, and, you know, that is part of the reason that the secretary general is so focused on, we need to ensure there's credibility to this. We need to ensure it's actually really driving action. And we need to, you know, be, you know, ensuring that those are really doing the work are recognized, um, while those that aren't, uh, you know, there are consequences to that. Now, obviously, the consequences will be more significant in, in an environment where you have regulation, um, but there are consequences, and we've seen it. We've seen lawsuits. We've seen, um, uh, you know, misleading advertising claims. We've seen a whole bunch of things that, that have happened. Um, and so there are real risks. And as I said, I talked to investors and others that they are looking for, you know, the, the leading, um, the, the high ambition coalition, I'll say, of folks that want to drive down climate action. And by the way, it's about future proofing your company. Um, uh, the, you need to be thinking the world is not going to look like it is. Climate change is real. Uh, it's accelerating. Um, and if you aren't really thinking hard about how do you transform uh you could go the way of, uh, I don't know, the VHS, the Walkman. The Dodo. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's not a bad, a good uh, comparison. But, uh, okay, so Catherine, um, absolutely, I think, um, uh, in, in actually Emmanuel Faber um, on, on the session um, a couple of days ago with Christiana Figueres and Oliver Bette mentioned that within the ISSB climate um, disclosure framework, the beta framework, um, you know, they are, are looking at this notion of, of um, including the need for climate resilience plans that corporates should start issuing these, which essentially is what you're talking about, which is essentially how is your business going to survive and thrive within a low carbon climate resilient economy. And it's, this is not about doing something just from the good of your heart. This is, this is about good business. This is about um, essentially uh, being a responsible steward and manager of, of, uh, of a business or of the assets of, of uh, beneficiaries. How, um, um, in terms of the high level expectations um, from the report, can you give us a, a bit of a, an idea about what you expect to be major messages that, that will be there and, and that the private sector can start to work on, digest, integrate into what they're doing? Uh, look, you know what? It's not going to be that long, so I cannot. I'm not going to give you any secrets right now. We we are committed to giving the, um, the Secretary General the report in advance of COP. I think the intention is that he will respond at COP. 
Um, and I have a task force. So I'm like a quarterback on a team and we're still, we're, you know, we're still landing things, but look, I don't think things will surprise people. I mean, what have we heard? We've heard um, that, you know, you can't just make a 2050 target and not do work right now. Um, so that's things like having interim targets. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people in this space, businesses, financial institutions, and regions are doing this. But, you know, you, you need to do the work now. We need to peak emissions by 2025 and, and lower them by half by 2030. So we do not have time. Um, also, when you make these commitments, you can't just buy your way out of it using credits. That's a huge issue uh, with voluntary carbon markets. Um, and so, you know, that's a real concern. And what is the net of zero? Um, that you got to be doing the work yourself and you have to cover all your emissions. And that includes emissions on your, on your, in your value chain. Um, you know, there are issues relating to fossil fuels and clearly we're, you know, with the, with the illegal Russian war that has caused problems, but climate change isn't going away and the risk of stranded assets remains, but more importantly, we got to drive down emissions. And so, you know, the, the, as I say, like some of this is just, you know, your emissions need to go down, your investments in clean need to go up and all of that needs to happen at scale as fast as possible. So um, that's my dog. Sorry. <laughs> Who's just coming in to say hello because I've been in a way. Um, so, I mean, I think that, that there, I, I don't think there'll be huge surprises. Um, I, I would say that there, this is a really uh, amazing group and very different from groups that I've been part of because it's extremely diverse. So half women, which is great, but also in terms of background. So we have scientists, business leaders, former regulators, former recovering politicians like me. Uh, we have environmentalists, um, but also really importantly, um, probably half our members are from the global South. So their perspective on things is very, it's very nuanced, I would say. Often more, we, you know, you know folks from the global North um, will say things and, you know, they'll say, well, this is, you know, the reality here, or, you know, what about an SME in Colombia? How are we going to be part of this? Or where's the money you want us to, you know, move to clean um, while, you know, maybe you're not now um, taking our energy and then, you know, not financing the transition. So you will see issues that uh, are nuanced and related to that. And I think they're really Yes, they're all related to net zero, but net zero is related to the big issues in climate and energy front um, and, and equality front. So I guess, but you know what? We're still working on it. Uh, stay tuned. Wonderful. Well, with that, Catherine, um, I really uh, thank you for today. And more importantly, thank you for steering and, and putting um, such effort into trying to, to get clarity. And I think in a very important way, bring together the potential the perspective, the needs and the, the solutions coming from the private sector, but also um, uh, different parts of the public sector, um, even up to, of course, the negotiators, because we need to bring the pieces together. Um, it has to be through open dialogue and basically by um, uh, not only making big commitments, but actually delivering on those. And, and the, the report the, uh, that you will shortly issue will definitely help uh, firm up. Um, we hope bring uh, credibility and also bring together the ships, public and private, so they don't pass each other in the night. We really need to work together. And for that, uh, huge thank you. And looking forward to continuing to hopefully deliver on uh, the exact types of recommendations that we are shortly expecting from you. Well, uh, thanks, Eric. It's great to be joining you, but also to the folks there that are working really hard, the High Ambition Coalition. Uh, you know, I hope you'll 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 read the recommendations, you'll absorb them, but also you'll just continue uh, to drive action because we're all in this together. We all have a role to play, uh, and we really don't have time, but we also have a huge opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Catherine McKenna. Thanks.